panelists join us on the stage, I will introduce them. This is a real treat and honor for me uh, to have this opportunity to participate. Uh, I did not know Professor Marable very well. Uh, most of my time as a graduate student, I spent across the river. And as many of you New Yorkers know, that's a world unto its own. I was a graduate student at Rutgers University. I did apply to Columbia, but uh, the powers that be at that time did not see fit uh, to offer me sufficient support to attend Columbia University. Uh, <laughs> life might have turned out differently. I did, however, in 2004, while a, a research fellow at the Vera Institute, um, there was a huge Africana criminal justice conference that, uh, that Manny convened, uh, along with Jeff Ward, who was also, at the time, a Vera fellow. And uh, that was really my first occasion to meet Professor Marable, who was a, a force of nature, and always one to take advantage of opportunity. And in this case, he was meeting me and thought I might have some insider information about the Nation of Islam or about Malcolm X, and so he pulled me aside and asked me what my future plans were after the fellowship and might I be interested in joining the team. I told him, fortunately, I was indentured to Indiana University <laughs> and that I'd have to leave soon. So, uh, so we didn't have an opportunity uh, to work together, but I was a huge admirer of his work. Um, I taught uh, his textbook um, on black America. I can't, for some reason, I'm having a, a, no, no, the one, race reform and rebellion, that's right. Uh, so as a, a very young professor at Rutgers, I think I was about 23 years old, teaching my first course on African American history, um, uh, Manning was my guide. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful. And we all know, everyone on this panel knows that those, those early books you read, whether as a graduate student as a, or as a young faculty member, they tend to stick, stick around in your consciousness. So I carry him with me. And it's a real treat and honor to be here to have this occasion uh, to uh, engage his work. And so without further ado, uh, let me introduce our esteemed uh, panel. Uh, to my uh, extreme right, we have uh, Bill Fletcher, Jr. He is the chairman of the board of directors for the International Labor Rights Forum. He's an executive editor of the Black Commentator and founder of the Center for Labor Renewal. A long-term labor, racial justice, and international activist, he is the immediate past president of Trans-Africa Forum. And of course, we all know Trans-Africa, national, national nonprofit organiz organization uh, that uh, helped to bring down apartheid. Uh, Mr. Fletcher is also a founder of the Black Radical Congress and is a senior scholar for the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. He is the co-author of Solitary, Solidarity Divided, the Crisis in Organized Labor and a New Path Toward Social Justice. Uh, to his left is Professor Augustine. We haven't met, so I apologize if I messed the name up. Augustine? Or Augustine. Augustine, okay. Lau Montez. Professor of Sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Uh, he received his PhD in Sociology from SUNY uh, Binghamton. Certainly shares a SUNY brand with a uh, professor to his left. You're gonna be all right. You don't usually look nervous, but you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> professor La Montez's specialties include world historical sociology and globalization. He, calls himself, uh, his expertise is political sociology. He is the author of several books, including the uh, Mambo Montage, The Latinization of New York City, an edited volume co-edited with uh, Arlene Davila. Uh, most recently, he published uh, a book in 2010 on race and citizenship. That's not the title, it's in Spanish, but uh, it escapes my vision at this uh, particular moment. Uh, his other works include Techno Futuros, Critical Inventions on Latino Studies, as well as Global Hegemony States and Anti-Systemic Movements, Politics and the Political in the Late Modern World System. Um, we are most certainly pleased to have him with us. 
And uh, to my immediate left is Dr. Peniel Joseph, professor of history at Tufts University and the author of the award-winning Waiting to the Midnight Hour, a narrative history of black power in America. He also wrote, uh, not long after that publication, Dark Days, Bright Nights from Black Power to Barack Obama and is the editor of the Black Power Movement, Rethinking the Civil Rights Black Power Era and Neighborhood Rebels Black Power at the Local Level. Uh, Dr. Joseph has been a major figure in uh, educating the larger profession and engaging the larger profession about black studies today. Um, publishing an important state of the field in the Journal of American uh, History just a couple of years ago. Uh, and he has uh, bridged the world of black studies scholarship with public engagement as a frequent uh, commentator in any number of public venues, including NPR and PBS. So please uh, join me in a warm round of applause for our esteemed panel today. I'm going to trust that, as is often the case, um, our panel um, will want to make some introductory comments uh, at whatever length they choose. Um, if they want to defer from introductory comments, um, I can open the floor up with questions. So now's your opportunity to set the frame. Uh, this panel is to engage uh, the biography, uh, a crowning achievement in Manning Marable's uh, scholarship. Oh, sure, I, sure, 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 yeah. five minutes, tops, yeah. Um, now, I'm a busy man as administrator of the Schomburg. I'm making a very long transition here as a uh, scholar to engage, and Professor Rickford uh, asked me this uh, fairly recently. Um, did you all prepare papers that you prefer to read? Yeah. Well, I'm happy to have you read. <laughs> so, um, who would like to go first? I'll, I'll go first. Okay, great, I will sit down. Well, I'm going to keep this. Um, I'm going to keep it brief because I'd like a give and take with the audience as well. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for the thanks to the organizers for um, the invitation. Um, briefly, I first encountered Manny Marable's work um, when I was high school in high school in New York City. Um, I'm the son of a Haitian immigrant, uh, Jermaine Joseph, who was a hospital worker uh, for um, $11.99 for 40 years. Uh, in New York City. Uh, my mom is 72 years old. Uh, she turned 73 in May, and I'm taking her to Paris for her birthday. Um, she's, she's the most um, important uh, person um, in my life, and she's the, the, the first uh, hero and historian that I ever had. My mom um, was somebody who talked about Toussaint, talked about Dessalines, talked about the Haitian Revolution, but also talked about Malcolm X, she talked about Stokely Carmichael, she talked to me about Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker um, before I was in high school. So the reason why I'm an activist and a scholar is because of Jermaine Joseph, and I'm very proud to acknowledge that always. Um, I first encountered Manning Marable um, through How Capitalism Underdevelops Black America uh, while I was in high school, and that book profoundly changed my life. Um, I first encountered Professor Marable in person in February of 1993 uh, during my last year at SUNY Stony Brook. And he was then at University of Colorado, and he was transitioning, and he was telling us that it was either between CUNY, the Graduate Center, or Columbia. Um, and he was very excited about the Malcolm X biography that he was working on. And we asked him, you know, when would that book come out? And he said, well, you know, I'm working hard on it, and you know, it, it shouldn't take that long, you know, at the time. You know? So at the time, he, was, you know, he, he, he was, hadn't built IRIS up yet. He hadn't built the Center for Contemporary Black History. He hadn't organized dozens and dozens of conferences on black studies, on race and democracy, on the black radical tradition. And he had um, 10 or 20 more books to write. Um, and he finally uh, published um, that book shortly before he passed away. But the book stands really as a magnum opus and, and a towering um, scholarly uh, achievement to uh, Manning Marable's uh, life, life's work. So before diving into Malcolm X, what I'd like to talk about briefly is, is Manning's scholarship and the way in which his scholarship transformed our approach to black studies. 
Um, Manning Marable's scholarship was broadly conceived around examining the black radical tradition. And that black radical tradition encompasses everything from um, the pan-Africanism of W.E.B. Du Bois to uh, the anti-imperialism of Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X to the grassroots movements for democracy by Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, to uh, Garveyism, to uh, social democratic and Marxist-Leninist movements, to the feminism of the Third World Women's Alliance. Uh, in his very famous book, How Capital Capitalism Underdevelops Black America, um, he has a chapter called Groundings with My Sisters, uh, which is really a sequel uh, to uh, what Walter Rodney writes about and how Europe underdeveloped uh, Africa. And Manning was one of the first black male scholars who we really consider uh, having a feminist praxis where he challenged the sexism and the misogyny within black radical traditions even as he talked about the, the, the way in which black feminism historically transforms the black radical tradition from Claudia Jones to Vicki Garvin to um, Gloria Richardson to Angela Davis and on and on. So when we think about Manning Marable in a very, very capacious way, uh, he's probably the most, uh, one of the most intellectually ambitious scholars of the black tradition that we've ever had rather than seeing black nationalism and Marxism and democracy as mutually exclusive, he was always interested in the way in which they overlapped, the way in which they intersected, the way in which sometimes scholars and organizations had one foot in each camp. So when we think about Manning Marable, M Manning was one of the most innovative, uh, uh, deeply insightful scholars and public intellectuals of our time because he looked at the black tradition in all of its totality. He looked at black conservatives, liberals, social democrats, feminists, Marxists, workers, elites, and he, 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 he looked at the black tradition in a panoramic way, and that panorama was linked to his whole idea of social and political transformation. So when we think about Manning Marable, the, the, the breadth and depth of his scholarship has literally and figuratively transformed how we think about black studies forever. So that is, in a, in a broad way, his biggest contribution to scholarship. Um, when we think about activism, Manning was always drawn to the activism of the working class. And in a way, the Malcolm X biography is a testament to that. Malcolm X is fundamentally the preeminent working class hero that the black community has ever produced. When we think about Malcolm X, Malcolm X is a working class hero who's also a pan-Africanist, who's also a black nationalist, who's also an anti-imperialist and a revolutionary. Manning Marable's Malcolm X rescues the icon from myths that have surrounded him since he passed away February 21st, 1965, since his murder. When you think about what the biography, which has rightfully won a Pulitzer Prize, has done, it's actually restored Malcolm X in a way that surpasses even the 1992 Spike Lee movie, and it even surpasses the frenzy we had in the late 80s, early 90s with the X-hats around uh, a, 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 a resuscitation of black nationalism and pan-Africanism in this sense. After reading Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, what one comes away with is beyond the fact that Malcolm X was a protean figure, one comes away with the fact that Malcolm X bestrides the global stage, the global stage of post-war decolonization alongside of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and global figures of post-war decolonization globally. Malcolm is not a marginal figure, he's a central figure to understanding not only international revolutionary narratives, but to also understanding the history of post-war black liberation and of American democracy in the post-war period. Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, has been criticized for that subtitle, subtitle, reinvention. What did Marable mean by reinvention? Some critics have argued that Malcolm didn't reinvent himself. He was always Malcolm. What, Mal what Manning Marable means by reinvention is evolution. 
What he means by reinvention is evolution. He's not trying to say that Malcolm X was some kind of huckster. He's not trying to say that El Haj Malik El Shabazz was some kind of pretender. He's saying that over the course of his short 39 years, he had a political and intellectual genius that allowed himself to evolve and to get to the depth of the black working class experience and to actually illustrate the hopes, the dreams, the yearnings of a black liberation project that predated him, but that he becomes one of the biggest architects of in the post-war period. So when we think about Malcolm X, the life of reinvention, Malcolm the Revolutionary is not lost in that biography. Malcolm the Revolutionary is all over that biography. Malcolm the Pan-Africanist is not lost in that biography. Malcolm the Pan-Africanist is all over that biography. Malcolm the Black Nationalist is not lost in that biography. Manning Marable did not hate black nationalism. Okay, Manning Marable is one of the, one of the quintessential uh, architects of a vision of black nationalism that understands that black nationalism is cosmopolitanism, it's not sectarian, it's not anti-feminist, it's inclusive, it's global, it's insightful, and when we read the, bi the biography of Malcolm X, the Malcolm X that we get is a Malcolm X as complex as the historical Malcolm actually was. The very fact that Manning has the courage to talk about some of Malcolm's shortcomings adds to Malcolm's iconography. It doesn't take away from Malcolm's I iconography, it adds to it. Malcolm was a flesh and blood, three-dimensional human being who had shortcomings. He was not infallible, he was not a god. And we don't need our historical icons to be gods. We are a more mature community than that. We don't need our icons to be without sin or to be without doubt. The kind of masculinity that Malcolm has and that Marable reveals in this biography is the kind of masculinity that we want our young people to have. There were times that Malcolm was scared for his family, for his wife, for his kids. He was under a death sentence. Of course, Malcolm is also bold, courageous, the quintessential revolutionary figure of the post-war period in the 1960s, the person with, without whom black power would not exist, but Malcolm was also a black man with a sense of humor. Malcolm was also a black man who recognized the dignity of black women. So when we think about Manning Marable's Malcolm X, Manning Marable's Malcolm X has not destroyed the icon. It's not deconstructed the icon. What it does ultimately is profoundly complicate and profoundly restore the importance of Malcolm X, not just to Harlem and not just to the United States, but to all revolutionary figures and activists then and now. So in closing, I'll say that the most important thing that we can come away with after reading, and remember, many of the critics of, of Malcolm X, The Life of Reinvention, have not read the book once, at least carefully. Because the criticism, and again, all books are subject to criticism, but some of the outrageous criticism that I've read shows me in a very clear way that these authors have not read the book. Not the end notes, but I'm saying the actual book, which is a disgrace. But after reading, for those of us who are willing to read not just the autobiography of Malcolm X, but Malcolm X, The Life of Reinvention, what we come away with is a profound sense of the importance of Malcolm. We come away with a profound sense of the way in which Malcolm tried to engage so many different communities within the black and the African diaspora, religious communities, cultural communities, young people. We come away with the sense of deep compassion and love that Malcolm X had for black people. And I'll say that again, deep compassion and love, because many people who are activists say that they want social change and transformation, but Malcolm X and Manning Marable both knew that without having love for that community that you want transformed, there's no social transformation that can take place. The Malcolm X that we read about in the biography, Malcolm X, The Life of Reinvention, is a Malcolm X who has deep and profound love for black people. So I'll say that Manning Marable's most profound contribution, finally, in this biography is one, restoring Malcolm X 
as a global figure, and remember, I'm saying a global figure, not a mainstream figure. The fact that he wins a Pulitzer Prize, we don't demonize, we don't demonize our scholar activists who drag, who drag the mainstream, right, into the 21st century. So the fact that he wins a Pulitzer Prize doesn't mean he mainstreams Malcolm. What he's done is actually shown the world the importance of this anti-imperialist, this revolutionary, this pan-Africanist, this radical activist who wanted nothing less to fundamentally transform not just American democracy and its institutions, but to transform the world. The human rights activist that Malcolm X always was, not that he becomes, that he always was, is on every single page of that book. And in doing so, Marable has brilliantly also told a history of the United States of America from 1925 to 1965 and the black liberation struggle that is the core of the American narrative. Thank you. Well, I, I should say that uh, besides the academic titles and, and publications that, that you had in, in your list, I am also an activist intellectual uh, who worked north-south as an Afro-Latino uh, activist. So I am speaking from that perspective also. I'm going to speak about the, the biography uh, that Manning wrote together with the, with the group of people, because it's a collective uh, process. Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, is a product of a monumental project carried on collectively over several decades, including intending to research and write the life and times of one of the principal protagonists of black politics and American life in the world historical moment of the 1960s. Therefore, I won't pretend to minimally assess it here, lest to make a balance of its contributions and limitations. I will rather present some general observations about its value and significance in this era of global crisis. Uh, economic, political, ethical, and ecological, and the concomitant, concomitant imperative of searching for alternative of liberation against the interlocking oppressions that we confront. Opening the epilogue, Marables writes, a biography maps the social architecture of an individual life, adding that the biographer has an additional burden to explain events and the perspective and actions of others that the subject could not possibly know that nevertheless had a direct bearing on the individual's life. This statement of method is consistent with the declared intent of representing Malcolm as a concrete historical man with changes and contradictions beyond mere hagiography and against its pervasive iconic character. Marable argues that to pursue this goal, one of the main challenges is to write not only with, but also in counterpoint to the most established referent in the collective memory of Malcolm life, namely the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley. The relative questioning of the absolute authority of what for generations had become a standard text about Malcolm's life, not only in the US, but also to scholars and activists throughout the planet, will certainly make Malcolm X a life of reinvention, a critiqued and debated book for years to come. I will argue that such debate will necessarily complexify and enrich our collective understanding of Malcolm and his historical meaning, not only for his times, but for our present and future. For instance, I know of two books programmed to be published that critically dialogue with Marable's biography of Malcolm. I contend this should signal a revival of public engagement with the figure of Malcolm and its current significance in so far as the, ter the terms of discussions are beyond simply dismissing or defending the contributions and questions raised by the book we are considering here. Instead, I suggest that reading and valorizing Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, should follow a critical methodology analogous to Marable's inquiry and interpretations of Malcolm's life. In this vein, I contend that it is impossible to aim for a definite biography because remembering the past is a contested terrain, especially when the politics of memory involves a high takes of power relations and transformations in the present and future which is clearly the case when representing such a central historical figure as Malcolm is for many of us in the global African diaspora. Hence, I propose to conceive our understanding of Malcolm's life as a collective project of continuous recasting and developing our radical archive. 
an open process that implies reading Malcolm X, The Life of Reinvention, on the one hand, as a substantive contribution to our memory based on serious research, and on the other hand, as a set of propositions to be explored and discussed. In this slide, I will highlight particular aspects of the project in what remains of my presentation. I should say that I am speaking both as an Afro-Latino activist as well as an historical sociologist that as such valorizes the book in question for what I will characterize as a world historical methodology in which Malcolm's biography is analytically framed within larger landscapes of political economy and geopolitics, such as the Great Depression and the Korean War. And I agree with the brother that is is the way of writing. Uh, modern history is a way of writing black history also. Uh, uh, such as the Great Depression and the Korean War, and historical moments and movements like Garveyism, the Non-Aligned Countries Conference at Bandung, and the Black Freedom Movement and anti-colonial struggles of the 1960s. This corresponds to a practice of biography as social, cultural, and political history, similarly to Marable's previous book on Du Bois as a champion of radical democracy. The lens through which the biography analyzes the biography, the, the, the biographer analyzes the biography of the main character and his historical scenarios are colored by an optic of intersectionality, to use a concept coined by African American feminist Kimberly Crenshaw, wherein class, gender, and sexuality are key interlocking factors to understand behavior and politics. This accounts for some controversial narrative, for example, concerning Malcolm's sexuality. Even though I will argue that Marable focuses more on the political than on the personal in most of the book, without uh, losing track of developing the character. In fact, one of the main veins that guides the narrative is mapping the terrain of black politics as an arena with a plurality of ideological and political perspective on the basis of differences of class, gender, generation, place, and religion. To keep playing political tunes, we can read Malcolm X a life of reinvention as a story of reinvention and redemption, where Malcolm evolves from street hustler to black Muslim the the theologies to prime leader and theories of black political radicalism. He chose continuities on his black nationalism, wherein African Americans are seen as a nation within a nation, a people, while demonstrating changes in political outlook. In this vein, the book demonstrates how Malcolm's sharp critique of racism as a core characteristic of American society shifts from a politics of racial segregation to a politics of self-determination and liberation that is more clearly tuned with pan-African radical traditions that historically combat capitalism, racism, and imperialism at once. In this tenor, Malcolm developed a political discourse that links racial oppression inside the US to imperial power abroad as when he, and here I quote Marable, who in turn quotes Malcolm, draw parallels between the legacies of European colonial rule he had seen in Africa with the system of institutional racism in the US as when he said that the police in Harlem, their presence is like occupation forces like an occupying army. These off-quoted remarks have much resonance today when the so-called war on drugs and mass incarceration that given its magnitudes and effects on black communities has been characterized by Michelle Alexander as a new Jim Crow. And you know, it's, it's, it's meaningful that Johanna mentioned before that Manning is one of the first people to observe that as one of the new forms of racism. I, I also had the, the, the honor and privilege to work with Manning from 1995, 1996, when I was at Columbia University, a, a Redstone Fellow. Marable also chose how as a, he built relations with grassroots like Fannie Lou Hamer and radical leaders such as Grace and Jane Boggs representing distinct sectors in the black freedom movement. And again, I, I agree with the brother that, that Manning uh, covered all the range of possibilities in, in, in black history. Malcolm began to articulate a radical democratic and social, socialist political analysis, more attuned to the critique of racial capitalism that Cedric Robinson defines as black Marxism. The strong intellectual vigor sharp critical edge and uncompromising ethical integrity of Malcolm as a political leader and theorist comes through clearly in the book, it's in, uh, uh, throughout the book. His indictments of the pervasiveness and centrality of violence to Western civilization showing their true colors from the multiple expressions of everyday racism to colonial violence reveals a critical sensibility forged in Africana thought and politics that Malcolm shares with key figures such as Césaire and Fanon, the famous and for many infamous assertion that the chicken come home to roost 
after Kennedy's assassination resonates with Cesar's maxim that fascism was the effect of colonial violence in Europe at the very heart of whiteness. In the book, Marable also built bridges for the dialogue between Malcolm with two eminent intellectuals of the African world, W.E.B. Du Bois and with Cialler James. Marable argues that like Du Bois, Malcolm understood that the color line configures a global divide where the darker races of the world encompass non-white peoples of all sorts, including Asians. This corresponds to the tight connections of Malcolm with the African continent and his anti-imperialism developed in the context of the tricontinental politics championed by Cuba of that, priorita that prioritized the liberation of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And, and again, I agree that Malcolm should be considered a major figure of that moment and, and beyond. This is the world historical context in which Malcolm organizes his secular organization, the Organization of African American Unity, named after the nascent Organization of African Unity. I begin to end my, my presentation saying that the OWAU heralded important political tasks at the local and global levels that are extremely relevant today. As is well, as is well known, an important projected strategy of the OAAU was, here I quote Ossie Davis as quoted by Marable, to bring the Negro question before the United Nations, to internationalize the whole question and to bring it before the whole world. In this tone, Malcolm advocated for a campaign to in indict Uncle Sam for the continued criminal injustices that our people experience in this government. This strategy derived from a statement of basic aims and objectives which stated that the OAAU intended to unify the Americans of African descent in their fight for human rights and dicti uh, dignity, which, which as, as is well known, changed the discourse from civil rights to human rights, which means to dedicate ourselves to the building of a political, economic, and social systems of justice and peace. This will be effected by means of grassroots organizing, mobilizing African Americans, quote, block by block, to make community aware of its power and potential. Malcolm's political predicament based on the urgent need of building and pursuing a strategy of grassroots organizing in African-American communities while projecting struggles globally and linking with movements in the diaspora, Africa and across the world is crucial in the legacy of Malcolm that we ought to recast in this conference. Playing this drum, Marvel writes in, in his, the epilogue, quote, Malcolm envisioned a modern version of Pan-Africanism based on global anti-racism. The UN Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa in 2001 was in many ways a fulfillment of Malcolm's internationalist vision. Malcolm believed that black freedom in the US depended on an internationalist geopolitical strategy, end quote. The region south of the Rio Grande that we call Latin America houses the largest population of people of African descent in the Americas. The official calculation is between 150 and 180 million. As put by Dudu Dieng, the UN official rapporteur for the Durban process against racism, such region is where the Durban agenda has implied more changes for both states and civil society. The main reason being the bigger of social movements of Afro-descendants. Because of the effervescence of black and indigenous ethnic racial politics in the context of neoliberal globalization, the new US imperialism, and the rise of a new wave of social movements and progressive politics, there has been a sort of cultural revolution shown in a previous denial of racism as a US problem to the official recognition of racial injustice as endemic even, even by conservative government. The result has been important innovations in racial policies such as the Ministry of Racial Equity of Brazil and the beginning of educational reform to recognize the histories, cultures, and intellectual production of African peoples, in other words, the emergence of, of black studies in, in, in the region, uh, which have a long history, but emerging as a, as a real movement, as a transformative movement. An important component of this redefinition of public cultures, and particularly in the political cultures of Afro-Latin American movement, is the iconic value of key figures like Malcolm. Because of this, the recasting and reconsidering of Malcolm in all its historical complexity that we're doing here, and that is, uh, one of the great contributions of, of, of the book 
is of primary importance to develop a more robust and critical political culture in Afro-Latin American and for U.S. Afro-Latinos who could partly act as a bridge between Afro-descendants North and South and between Black and Brown in the U.S. As we are on the eve of, on the eve of entering the decade of Afro-descendant as a step forward toward creating a permanent forum for people of Afro African descent in the United Nations. You know that 2013 has been declared as the decade of Afro descendants, the, 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 the beginning. And the, the, the idea is to create a permanent forum for Afro descendants in the United Nations, which is one of the goals that came out of the Durban agenda. It is imperative to recast, debate, and develop the legacies of Malcolm, a figure of the historical vision and ethical integrity that we urgently need in the long march against all the forms of oppression, class, racial, gender, sexual, ecological, to transform these times of crisis into a prelude into the real realm of liberation. The best honor to the legacies of both Malcolm and Manning will be to take advantage of this space open here this weekend to facilitate the building of yet another version of a radical black movement. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to thank the organizers of this conference. Um, this is tremendous. Uh, and, and I also want to say that I think that one of the principal challenges, leaving aside resources for the organizers of this conference, was to ensure that this was not awake. I mean that quite seriously. To, to ensure that this wasn't a memorial. It's not. Uh, this is a time uh, to look at the issues that Manning was addressing and that all of us face in the real world and use the work that Manning created, that he offered us as a framework, as a jumping off point, uh, not as an end point. It's not a point to worship him. He was a great friend of many of ours, but it, it's a point of inspiration. So it's really important, I was thinking about this as, as we started moving, it's important for us not to, and I, I, and I say this as someone uh, who viewed Manning as, as my older brother, uh, it's, it's important for us not to dwell in sadness, but to actually be ecstatic about the work uh, that Manning produced and what he meant to all of us. And, and I think that, I, I just want to thank the organizers for framing this in a way that we actually can celebrate Manning's life and work. Um, now, I, I have a problem. Dr. Joseph said virtually everything that I was going to say. <laughs> and I mean that quite seriously. I'm sitting here panicking. I'm saying, oh my God. Uh, and it's like, I'm look I, you know, I was looking through the speech like several times. Is there anything I can salvage in the speech? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to be redundant, so this, this presents a problem. So I'm, I'm going to go in a completely different direction. Um, a, a few points, and then we can open this up. One of the things that has been obsessing me over the last number of uh, months since the book came out, but particularly after a debate that I participated in that Brother Herb Boyd uh, hosted at the Left Forum a few weeks ago, uh, is a question of whether my generation can actually discuss Malcolm X. And, and I mean this very seriously. Uh, I was thinking about it, and the way it came together, and this may sound very bizarre, is that my wife was talking about Peru and about how there are these difficulties discussing the whole period of the uprising of Sendero Luminoso and the, oppression, the repression by Fujimori's government and the viciousness that went on. And a lot of people just simply can't talk about it. And, and I started thinking that I'm not at all convinced that my generation, the baby boomer generation, in case you were unsure of that, um, <laughs> whether my generation can actually have this discussion. Uh, because part of what I have seen in the uproar that took place after the publication of this book was a real reluctance to deal with a, a materialist analysis of the life of a hero to millions of people. Uh, there was a, a way in which many people took any suggestion that Malcolm was anything less than a saint as a criticism, as an indictment. 
And, and it made it impossible for many people to actually, uh, actually have that discussion. And, and so I was very frightened by this. And, and I feel like in, in a lot of ways, I'm prepared to almost write off my generation and say that on, on, this, on this subject, and this subject alone, because I'm actually proud of my generation, uh, but on this subject, and say that this book is actually not for my generation. This book is for those that are younger. This book is for those that are thinking about and grappling with the question of how to construct a new revolutionary project. And what can we learn from the life and the struggles of this working class hero who was a hood, who was absolutely far from perfect. Now, one experience that uh, helped me understand some of the reactions to the book was years ago in Boston, I uh, interviewed a cook who had known Malcolm. And uh, I, I was talking with him, and he was describing how uh, after Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, he had had a discussion with this cook. Um, they had met each other on the railroads uh, back in the 40s. And, and this cook said to me, and Malcolm was debating whether or not to return to the Nation of Islam. I was ready to kill this individual. I was absolutely ready to slice him, slice and dice. How dare, how dare he question my hero? How dare he raise the idea that my hero, who clearly was on a straight path towards revolutionary anti-imperialism, could have had any doubts? The reaction was visceral. It was very, very deep. And it was for years that I had to grapple with why did I have that kind of reaction? And so when I, when I noticed what happened in the aftermath of the publication of this book, it, it wasn't simple. I, could, I wasn't like looking down my, at my nose at, uh, at, at uh, the people that responded. But I could actually identify with it. I could identify with what happens when you've transformed the human being into a demigod. What has happened when you've transformed the human being who was great, who was fantastic, who was humorous, but also was flawed in many ways. When you've transformed that person into someone that is impervious to criticism, I absolutely understand the reaction, which is why I look to younger people to have the debate which I think needs to happen. I mean, what's really interesting is that in discussions I had with Manning prior, obviously prior to his death, but prior to the publication of this book, um, what was interesting was that what he thought was going to be the most controversial part of this book has almost not been discussed at all. That is, who actually killed Malcolm? There has been virtually no discussion about this. There's been virtually no discussion about this triad that, that Marable describes, which I thought was absolutely phen uh, uh, phenomenal in terms of, obviously, elements in the nation of Islam, the state, but elements within Malcolm's own organization. And, and the way that this came together and the factors that, that, uh, that, that made this possible, I was looking for a discussion on this. Virtually nobody has taken up that task. Virtually no one has said, I mean, there were some initial uh, efforts, that, some of which Herb was involved in, about reopening the case, but it hasn't taken on the form of a mass movement. Instead, we focus on, did Malcolm have same-sex relations with some guy at one point back in the 1940s? And what was the significance of that, right? We have these discussions about whether or not Malcolm would have been excited about the UN World Conference Against Racism, or was the UN World Conference Against Racism a discussion among imperialists? We have this, these sort of bizarre discussions. Rather than looking at what it was that Mal Marable was trying to really uh, draw out for us, I, I, I just want to say finally that this, this book forces us all to think about the refoundation of radical politics that must take place in the 21st century. And in that sense, the book formally, as well as in its, its direct content, challenges the mythologizing, not simply of Malcolm, but of the 50s and 60s and 70s. It challenges those, for example, that look at the history of the Black Panther Party, maybe adopt the name, maybe put on a uniform, but are completely absent the politics and don't understand what the limits of the politics were 
of the Panthers or many of the other groups that emerged in the 1960s and 70s. And so what Marable does through this materialist examination is he says, let us understand reality, let us understand the context, and through that, let us then refound radical politics that we absolutely need to survive and win in the 21st century. Thank you very much. We've achieved a new record here at the Schomburg for an academic panel. Uh, you all did that in just about 45 minutes, so we have a good, good amount of time. I'm going to take uh, some um, executive privilege here and ask a couple questions, given that uh, uh, Bill ceded some of his time. One of them has to do with what I think uh, Peniel did at the beginning, which was to sort of take on this question of reinvention. And I want to re-engage that question from a slightly different perspective. So whether we call it reinvention or evolution, um, there is a Malcolm that outlives the one that we've heard a lot about today, which is, I would argue, um, the Malcolm that is pan-Africanist, that is an anti-imperial, that is global, which is really not the Malcolm that either Marable describes in most of the book, and not, not in the spirit in which you conveyed it, Peniel, but in the actual details of his life. In, in that transformation that is happening, you call evolution. And I wanted to, to challenge what I've heard here today, which is, I, I think, the most evolved, again, to use your language, Malcolm, and, and ask the question, was he a man ahead of his times? And so if, if, there's, if the question right now that Bill has posed to us, if baby boomers can't handle Malcolm as Marable, has presented him to us, did Malcolm's own contemporaries, could they handle that Malcolm? Was Malcolm in 1964 and 1965 so exceptional as an individual that he was really no longer the working class leader that you describe him, that, that, um, that, the, that the black America that he came from was not able to process and appreciate him in that moment. This, this is a two-part question, so that, that's the first one. What are we to make of the fact that in his own moment he might have transcended his own people in the same way that his contemporaries today are unwilling to handle, as Bill has described, the complexity of, of him? And the reason that matters is because if, you, if we take what you say as who he actually was, then we actually in, in, Man, in Marable's own rendering, make him a new kind of mythical figure. We, we make him so much better than the people he left behind. Uh, Mal Malcolm was not, not a populist, right? I mean, not by the civil rights leaders, not by those who, I mean, we know even the civil rights leadership was exceptional by comparison to the willingness of the, of the masses of black folks to make those sacrifices, whether it was in the Jim Crow South or in Detroit. So you've got layers and layers of distance um, where Malcolm is here, the civil rights leaders are here, the silent black majority, I would argue, represent that base. So let's, let's wrestle with that a little bit. Well, well I'd, I'd say one, in terms of, um, and I'm gonna bring up something um, Augustine just did, uh, in terms of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, and I think um, like uh, Joanna Fernandez said earlier, uh, certainly Manning is a trailblazer in talking about the prison industrial complex and Angela Davis who's going to be here is a trailblazer and now um, Michelle Alexander, New Jim Crow, it's a bestseller, it's a book I've been teaching for the last couple of years and it's talking about mass incarceration but one of the things that Manning does when you read the biography very brilliantly and in his other scholarship he does this too, Manning Marable was always aware of the, the situation between the relationship between African Americans and the criminal justice system and a person, when I talk about Malcolm as a working class hero, the black activist, more than Dr. Martin Luther King, more than any other black activist who has a specific relationship with the criminal justice system, who's not just saying to people, you know, I kind of understand your pain because I got a cousin who went to jail. The person who was in jail, in Charlestown Jail, uh, Massachusetts, in three different jails in Massachusetts um, between 1946 and when he's paroled, um, August 7th, 1952, is, is Malcolm Little. So when we think about like Malcolm Little, the Nation of Islam, the transformation to Malcolm X, 
he is not just a working class hero, but he becomes um, um, an African American everyman in a sense because the nation is reaching out to incarcerated black men. And so when we think about uh, Malcolm in 64, do I think he's ahead of his time? I think he's representative of his time. Um, shortly after Malcolm um, dies, is assassinated, black power becomes a, a um, grassroots phenomenon. And in a way, even during his time, it was as well. So I, I would definitely say that one of the things the book shows, I don't think, on one level, he's an exceptional individual. But on, an, on another level, um, one of the things Marable shows in the biography is that even when he was the so-called hustler, he was telling people, look, I know about Marcus Garvey because my father used to be an organizer with Garvey. Um, his autobiography downplays his own literacy before Elijah Muhammad. One of the brilliant things about Marable's biography, and I agree with Bill when he talks about a materialist conception and the way in which he lays it out, because Manning Marable, above all, too, was a social scientist, because people don't think uh, black people can be social scientists and careful researchers. I mean, he was a social scientist. I mean, he, 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 he's a very, very careful historian. Um, when he did talks, he could, he could um, um, illustrate a million facts, and we all know it. Anybody who's ever heard Manning speak, he would tell you what the black economic, uh, uh, you know, what black folks were making in 1976, October of 1976. And you'd be in the audience like, damn, how'd he remember that? And then he'd go off and say, well, you know, here's the, the GDP of Brazil in 1997. And you were like, I know he didn't remember that. But, but he had that all in his head. And when we think about the, the biography, he, he sets up a Malcolm X who is evolving very subtly and incrementally. So I agree that um, Man Malcolm evolves, but he shows us that, one, the criminality that Malcolm talks about in the autobiography is, is, is at variance in terms of empirical evidence. There is criminality, but at times he exaggerates. Two, the way in which he extols the virtue of the uh, honorable Elijah Muhammad, who obviously was very, very important um, to his understanding of politics. He possessed an understanding of politics and an understanding of, of um, of history and an understanding of Jim Crow in a way, even before um, um, going to prison. So in a way, I'd say that he's, he's an exceptional human being, but certainly he's not an exception to his times. He's definitely a man of his time. Bill, you want to jump in, Augustine? I mean, I, 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 will, I will say that the, the metaphor of reinvention uh, is, is a way of, of understanding Malcolm in context. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, you call it a materialist, I call it a social, cultural, and political history. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a social uh, scientist uh, framing Malcolm as, as a real historical agent in different moments. And so he's reinventing himself uh, because he's living different moments uh, very intensively. In, in his relatively short life. Uh, so in a sense, he's a man of his time uh, that goes through different moments that, that uh, in which he reinvents himself from, from being a, a, a child of a, a Garvey family to being a, a street person. And there, you know, there, there are, uh, really brilliant moments of cultural history. I mean, you see the, the bebop politics, you see the, the uh, suit suitor, uh, you see the, the, the uh, agency of this man who, who is uh, defining himself in each different moment from there to go to jail, uh, to become a, a member of Nation of Islam, to, to go to all sorts of contradictions to reinvent himself. As, as, as a Malcolm that we are vindicating here. But in each of these moments, you feel the real human being in context. And that, that is part of, of the, the genius, uh, of the brilliance of, of, of the book, that, that is, is really uh, developing uh, the character of Malcolm in, in real history. On the one hand, framing the, the large historical context in which we, he lives in terms of black history, in terms of what are the, the key kind of, of a world historical 
event that framed his life uh, from the depression of 1930s to the Korean War to the Bandung Conference of Non-Allied Countries uh, to the movements of the 1960s and how he emerged I, I, I don't, and, I, I don't, as an exceptional man in the sense that he becomes a leader and he becomes a visionary. And in that sense, he is exceptional, but he is an, a, a leader of the time that that leaves a vision that we still recuperate, but that in, in the moment he becomes uh, recognized by, by different contexts in which he is a leader. I mean, from, from being the one who builds the nation of Islam, really, as a mass movement, to become the, the voice that is going to handle the Black Panthers and the Black Power can I, can I, um, Bill, I want you to respond, but I want to <laughs> sharpen the question a little bit and say that what I'm hearing in your um, summary of, of those moments uh, is that he managed to be a Garveyite when most Garveyites never moved past being Garveyites. He managed to be a member of the Nation of Islam, a leader of the Nation of Islam, when most members of the nation, for, for most of his life, didn't move past being members of the nation. He managed to be an anti-imperialist and a pan-Africanist when most black folks weren't pan-Africanist and anti-imperial. So in a sense, he's, he's every heroic thing in Maribel's conception of him that represents the best of the black radical tradition when, when most human beings are not capable of embodying all of those amazing traits. That's, and I'm suggesting that the baby boomer generation is representing the frailty of humanity and not being able to evolve just like Manning was, that they're trapped in their particular moment um, in the ways that Malcolm left behind the Garveyites and the nation. So that's what I'm saying. You, we've, we've kind of created a different kind of pedestal for, for Malcolm, yeah. perhaps. It's a question, right? It's See, just a question. Um, my, <laughs> my conclusion is actually very different. Um, in, in the debate that I mentioned before that Herb hosted, uh, Amiri Baraka ridiculed the notion that this book humanized Malcolm. Um, I'm sorry that Amiri did that uh, because I, I I think that that's precisely what this book did. I mean, when I looked, when I read the book and finished the book, what struck me was, of course he was exceptional, but in reading the book, I realized how many Malcolms I knew. You see, and, and it's like through my, my history of activism, I've met many, many Malcolms. And, uh, and, and one of the things that keeps coming up in activism is this problem of, and this is why mythologizing is so dangerous, because many times I would encounter activists who are tremendous activists, but they feel like they can't compare to Malcolm. They can't compare to Fannie Lou Hamer. They can't compare to King. And so they give up. They, they might have family problems. Maybe there's a separation in the family and they feel like, well, I can't continue to be an activist. Or maybe they have doubts. I mean, many times I run across activists who have doubts and feel like it's maybe time to abandon ship because, precisely because I have doubts. And in reading that book, you find this person who had family problems, who had doubts, all these different issues, and yet was the Malcolm that we loved and needed. So to me, what was wonderful about this book was recognizing that regular people can transform into great and exceptional leaders. And, and that's why I think Amiri Baraka was dead wrong in his ridicule. The floor is open, so if you have a question, we've got, uh, we've got a good time, we've got 20 minutes. Um, so please make your way to, um, yeah, I'm sorry. So I want to remind you that we, we would appreciate a straightforward question in the interest of fairness and, and uh, hearing from as many voices as possible. Right. Yes. Back in 1964, I attended a meeting of the May 2nd movement at the Manhattan Center. And I walk in and Mari Baraka, he's Leroy Jones then, is talking, describing his experiences with the police in New York. As he's talking, who comes in, this is under the auspices of the May 2nd movement, the Progressive Labor Party's youth wing, that's split from the Communist Party. 
As he's talking, Malcolm X comes in and stands next to me. I was a freshman at Columbia and shy. I'm not shy now. After Imari Baraka, Leroy Jones then, finished talking, John Hammond Jr., the blues singer, got up and spoke. I sang, I mean, played the guitar. Fabulous, okay? And Bob Dylan walks in and stands next to Malcolm. Now the potential, when you talk about the many Malcolms, that struck me about his revolutionary side. And we all know that uh, the guy who worked on the autobiography with him was working for the feds and doctored the book, okay? So we got a very false picture. It always struck me the dissonance between that and what I actually experienced that evening in, in uh, 64. The other point I want to make about, and I want you to comment on this, because well, no, he, no, so, so, he was going so, out so to the new left. Just, just he was you, going out to the new left. Can I just, out of respect, can if you are going to make a comment because you insist upon it, the comment was great, but no comment and a question, because there's, look behind you. Yeah, but I'm just saying, he but, had an international stature that no other figure of the civil rights movement had of that period. That's the greatness of Marable's book. That's what really comes out in the book. He goes to 11 countries, greeted by 11 heads of state. So that's really made him dangerous. On a local level, his connections with the new left. On an international level, the state's, state's spokesperson for, he was actually, he was the American State Department that we needed at the time, and we need today. And, and panelists don't, I mean, because uh, we've got a healthy audience, nice energy, um, maybe self-select your, um, who gets to answer a question, and we won't have multiple responses to the questions, great. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. This is great. This is really, really great. I, I've uh, read the um, book. Uh, I'm not finished with it, but I have just one question to ask. Well, just one question. I just want to know how much, uh, this is uh, addressed to uh, Professor uh, Joseph and Professor Fletcher. How much of Malcolm X's book, um, A Life of Reconstruction, has been edited out if, if you know, I mean, if you can tell me, I just would like to know. Thank you. Good question, thank you. Um, I actually don't know. Uh, I, I, I looked at um, an earlier draft of the book, which seemed to be, the, the final version seemed to be pretty much in line with that. The, uh, there was one particular thing in the final chapter uh, initial wording that I, cur I was curious about that the editor may have done something with, but uh, the, I, I think the book was was. Uh, uh, I mean, that was it. Well, I, I, I'm, you, you're suggesting that there was stuff that was kept out of Marable's book. Well, most books they have they um, edited. I mean, especially in uh, the uh, Columbia, they they'll yes. edit. I just I just want to know if I don't think we know. Yeah, no one yeah, knows. We don't know. And, okay, so yeah, so, so I, I thought Dr. Mullins might take a stab know. at it. Listen. Oh, you want me to bring the microphone to her? It won't reach that far. Okay, okay. Here, Dr. Mullins, if you wouldn't mind. I'm Manning's wife, and uh, I lived with him for the 10 years that he was writing the book, so I have some uh, close contact with it and I'm very intimate with it. And Manning would not allow things to be edited out that he thought were important. He wrote the book as he wanted to write it. Uh, in any book, you can't say everything. In any book, in any work, you make a choice of what you can put in. But Manning was, if uh, the gentleman is suggesting, the brother is suggesting that uh, Manning allowed editors to edit stuff out of the book, no he didn't. I mean, there was, some, there was fights, so there were uh, struggles over words sometimes, but this is the book that Manning wrote. Good evening, and thank you for your presentation. And <clears throat> one of the things <clears throat> that the Schomburg and a presentation like this will do is make you take, tell your age. I am a proud boomer, and I like you putting it out there that perhaps boomers were not um, able to uh, have
have a rational discussion about this book. <clears throat> My students, which would be the age of the two brilliant gentlemen there, they can. And <laughs> my students, and I mean this in all sincerity and I don't want to demean, but I'm wondering if it's something with gender because the black women that I know, just a second, I already told you I was a boomer. Full closure, I'm 62. So I'm just wondering if it's something, and help me brothers, if it's not something that men can't discuss, because the women are getting it. We, women can understand. Just, just my question, I, I, I'm not being facetious. I just need to understand, because when you say boomer, you're coming on over with me. And I know that I understand I'm a part of all of it, and I try to be connected with the other generations. And I'm thinking that you are on to something when you say boomers, but you should say, I think you should qualify it yeah. and say perhaps we men are not getting it just like women are not going to understand why you get there and run and get knocked down on football and tackled. And all. I don't understand that. OK, so and I think it's something like that. But women that I am very close with in the academy, my students, they get it. We, we really, really had deep discussions. And I, when people, I, I lose it when they go off about the book because it is so well documented. If you go to Lowell, a Butler Library, it's digitized. I've taken students there, and if there's a quote, you can put the curse on it, and it'll take you straight to the document that he is quoting. So I know that the book is airtight. If you read it, and if you're a boomer, and if you're a female of, you know, past menopause, you get it. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, I'm, I'm a feminist, so I can say that you're beautiful you know, in terms of 62. So I can say that, first of all. Um, yeah, that's Ru Ru Russ. I, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm right there with you, Professor Rickford. Um, in terms of, you know, Bill is the better person to answer, whether it's men or gender. You know, on that. I think you're on to something. I mean, no, absolutely. Um, there are women of our generation that have reacted badly, but overwhelmingly, it's been a men thing. Absolutely, there's no question about it, hands down. And uh, I, I, I think that this really does go in a very weird way to Ozzie Davis's tribute to Malcolm when he talked about our shining black manhood yeah. Yeah. and this idea of what it meant to be a man. And I think that many of my generation that became radicalized were inspired where Malcolm was our jumping off point in many ways, even if we had been active before, uh, that this issue of this is a man, this is what I'm supposed to be, and, and our own identities have gotten so wrapped up into that. So, uh, I, I think I, I accept that as a friendly amendment. Jo Johanna, I, you're just like me, so I'm going to ask you to tighten it. Okay. Well, right. I, I want to answer that question briefly because clearly the men are on the panel and they can't address the question. Uh, essentially, Malcolm X is the symbol of black militant defiant masculinity in a society that has since you know the presence of uh, uh, since slavery emasculated African American men so so that means that a lot of men who black men who are committed to that larger than life symbol that Malcolm has become can't deal with his humanity I mean, when I, when I read uh, the, the bit about, which is one sentence, Ma uh, uh, Malcolm's possible encounter with 
uh, with a man, I thought, wow, the gay black people in America and the world are holding up Malcolm X as their hero. I mean, so it, this, is, this is clearly a conversation that is influenced by um, identity, but that's not what I really wanted to say. Uh, uh, the, the, the question that was posed initially about Malcolm being ahead of his, his time presupposes that working class black people in this country at the time were somehow backward politically. Um, but it's important to note that like Malcolm, the majority of African Americans were experiencing and seeing the uh, increased uh, uh, presence of the United States in Vietnam. The, the majority of African Americans were seeing Africa's map being transformed as a result of decolonization and were, uh, and were connecting to that. And, and, and you, I'm just thinking, when you, when you pose the question, I thought of Robert Williams. Robert Williams in the South was talking about the same things that Malcolm X um, was talking about. And, and I also thought about 1963, not in the North, but in the South, in Birmingham. Uh, Martin Luther King wanted to have a successful demonstration in Birmingham, and in order to do that successfully, he realized that he was going to have to broaden his demands so that the majority of African American people in Birmingham would come out to his campaign. So he put forward the package deal. That is, that our demands are not just to sit alongside of white people in a restaurant, which is ultimately a middle class demand, but if the civil rights and black power movement is gonna succeed, we're gonna have to talk about jobs Jobs. We're going to talk, have to talk about schools. We're going to have to talk about the priorities of, of this society. So what we and the first riots in the 1960s didn't happen in the north. They happened in the south. And in fact, broadening the the agenda of the civil rights movement in many ways encouraged even more uh, rebellion. Why? Because black Johanna, people you, please black people were already aware. <laughs> Uh, that, that things were moving forward. And what was brilliant about Malcolm, and I think that, Mo that, that Manning uh, assessed this, is that he best captured right, the aspirations and politics of working class black people. When, when Che Guevara was asked once why he remained in the Cuban Communist Party, he answered the, the following that he became a communist because he thought that revolutionaries were heroes and that he left the communist party when he realized that revolutionaries were not angels, but he came back because that's the only decent way to live. Mm. Mm. And, and with that in mind, I'll ask my question, especially uh, to point uh, to something that Fletcher said that I thought was very important. When you're in the process of transforming a society, one of the main problems is the nature of the state and, and the class that controls the state in order to reproduce the conditions of exploitation that prevail to accumulate surplus value. Now, if we get <laughs> sidetracked with all of these other small fires that have been alluded to here, it's to ignore the nature of the state. It's a very conservative dance. So here's, oh, here's my question. What is it about the way Malcolm X was assassinated or executed that we can learn from, not only in the biography, but in Marable's uh, work about it, in order to understand the nature of the state inside this empire that's not only American, but that is run by the European Union, Japan, and China? Again, what is it that this way of dying and the way of killing alleged heroes teaches us about the nature of the state, not only as CLR and Walter said, so that we can learn what they've done to us, but so that we can come to an agreement about what we are going to do now. Thank you. Uh, before a uh, major response, I hate to interject, but we are running out of time. I don't want to lose anybody's question. 
There's so much time. I think afterwards we're going to have a reception. People who are on the panel can be approached individually. Collectively, we can stand together and discuss. But our time in this room is coming to a close. So please keep that in mind when you respond to that question. I think we'll only have a chance for one other person to um, put their thoughts into the public realm. Why don't, why don't we then do, do it this way? We, we have the nature of, of the state. Um, and we'll, we are. That's what I'm suggesting. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, too, am a baby boomer. Uh, I was in SNCC, no bill, from uh, black, uh, black Radical Congress. But I was very intrigued about the notion of the danger of mythologizing our black iconic figures, which brings us to Barack Obama. Because, Bill, you posed something that was very interesting that your generation, my generation, the baby boomers, were not prepared or ready to talk about Malcolm. I disagree with you, and I disagree with you about uh, uh, Amiri Baraka. I don't think that he ridiculed you. I think he challenged, he challenged you. And I think that one of the weakness of this panel is that you should have also an alternative view as well as that of women on this panel. But nevertheless, let me get to this, this matter and this paradigm that you raise of mythologizing these black uh, iconic figures. And we know with this generation, there is no one more iconic than that of the current president, Barack Obama. Now, in 2007, I realized and knew he was the face of US imperialism, a beautiful, intelligent brown face, but nevertheless, the brown face of US imperialism and empire, both home and abroad. Now, how do you take this within the context of Mer Marable's book? And I believe, Bill, I heard you say that, or it was suggested by some, and I think it was by Purnell, that Manny Marable had Malcolm on the road of this current, you know, new black radicalism that could possibly have embraced Barack Obama. And there are so many contradictions in this presentation that I wasn't able to keep up with all of them. Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think, are the conference organizers uh, evolving the plan? Um, I see uh, Russell moving. No, are we done? Yes. So more questions. OK, cool. Guys, take notes. Uh, briefly, by concern, again, the imbalance. If you're having a scholarly discussion, I think it's dishonest to have no critics, no constructive civil critics of the work on the panel. Uh, I'd have to uh, say that I thought it was a very well-written book. I don't think it was his best book. Um, there were serious problems in the book. If a guy says I had a, uh, an affair with your wife, is that a historical fact? Uh, was there any ability to get a second? There are just statements in the book that I think are uh, questionable, and I think you should have had someone on the panel who could uh, civilly uh, question that. A lot of what I see in the book is similar to uh, Du Bois criticism of Garvey. He didn't like the hats, he didn't like the uniform, he didn't like the regalia, but 40 or 50 years later he accepted the central role of Garvey and Garveyism. Uh, I think you're wrong not to have a panelist to talk about problems. I would like for some of the panel members you know, you're saying don't make Malcolm an icon, but you're really making Marable an icon. I haven't heard one discouraging word about anything that he said or done here, and I think it's up to the panelists to identify problems of competency in the preparation of the work. It's getting hot. It's getting hot in here. All right. Glad I'm not on the panel. Just I just have a simple question. Song. I go to Lehman College and I am African American studies major. Um, I just learned about this book and this whole forum from my professor, Professor Robert Spencer. And thank you so much for having it. 
But me as a mother of three grown African American, and one being a male, who have went to jail, who have no job, what would you want me to get from that book? What would you want me? Because I'm from the next generation. I was born in 62, I'm the next generation. So everything I know about Malcolm, I read about him. I didn't experience it. Thank you. I, I think you know, Malcolm occupied really interesting spaces that got presented as contradictions. You know, he occupied both the, sensu the sensual and the Puritan, occupied the uneducated and the educated, the criminal and the uh, global, global transnational figure. And I think this point about what part of him lives on, especially within the context of academic discussion, it's important to me that it doesn't leave out beyond kind of sensationalist Alex Haley kind of genre narrative, the importance of him seeking out and achieving a genuine education as a convict, um, keeping that class, that class distinction in mind of why that was exceptional and shouldn't be exceptional, or how those of us, I should be transparent in that I'm the child of incarcerated people and uh, definitely informed my idea of how education is accessed. I never went to college, they didn't before me, so on and so forth. But seeing people seek out education and knowing that one's identity can be both informed by that type of marginalization, but also by the achievement that Malcolm articulated so well around accessing education and not exceptionalizing himself as somebody who accessed that education, not the kind of reactionary narrative of he can make it, you can make it too. So I, I feel like within this context of how we talk about him, this part of him that lives on, it's so easy to talk about the, the, the pan-global part of him that lives on and the one who met with heads of state and the one who became a theologian and, and leave behind the person who accessed education as a convict. Thank you. This is our last uh, question. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. gentlemen. Sorry. Thank you. I'll try to make it brief. Um, mm -hmm. My name is Akbar Muhammad, and Dr. Manning mentioned me in the book uh, as Larry Forex Prescott. But I just wanted to do two things. One is uh, Mr. Joseph, Professor Joseph, I really enjoyed your remarks. There were a lot of things you said, but also Malcolm was a religious man. Malcolm's religion is left out. When he was struggling with the um, OAAU and Muslim Mosque Incorporated, there were those that said he didn't need Muslim Mosque Incorporated, but he insisted. And I think that a, a view of his religion cannot be left out. I know this may not be the crowd that want to talk about it, <laughs> but, uh, but an, in, an intense study of uh, the Ikhwan Muslimin, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they are very political now. There are social reforms that they want but they started with the base of their faith. And Hassan Benner, who started, and I think it deserves some research as we talk about Malcolm. Uh, Brother Muhammad, your great-grandfather made a profound statement. He said that there are men and women who are born with the gift of prophecy. Others attain it through an intense study of history. Malcolm had a gift. His gift was his ability to articulate what he believed. But he also studied, and his study of history gave him a healthy appreciation of the social dynamics in the world so he could interact as a religious man also with the socialist and the Marxist community and others because he understood that dynamic. I want to thank Professor Zaire, who made it possible for me to spend, I believe, nine hours in interviews with Dr. Manning. And he is the author of this tremendous work. Uh, and many in this room would not know that Minister Farrakhan encouraged his whole community to read the book. He said, I may not disagree, I may not agree with everything in it, but he told the believers in his community, but you should read it. I read it and I could not put it down, especially his international travel. So I think that as we discuss it, we need to discuss Malcolm's base, and his base was the religion of Islam. Thank you. That was uh, a wonderful round of questions and comments and poses a new uh, 
possibility of a new format for these kinds of conversations, just letting people speak freely, uh, and then you know we, we get in where we, where we fit in. So <laughs> I've tried to um, capture a couple of things, and I'll just throw them out there. Uh, Malcolm X, you know, if, if the old saying is uh, WWJD, it would be WWMD. What would Malcolm do in the wake of uh, Barack Obama? That's one question. Um, the other question is, of course, the religious uh, life of Malcolm that shaped his, his worldview, that, uh, the most recent question, the nature of state violence. What do we pass on to young people who aren't reading this book? Um, they're not being taught black history in our schools, so we most certainly know that the vast majority of our young people are not reading uh, Marable's biography. So if we were to cliff note the book, what would we want to say uh, to them? Um, the question of critics. Um, uh, this is a panel that obviously has uh, praised the book for, for the most part, although I think uh, with, with a longer conversation, um, you might begin to unpack that. So maybe now is the opportunity for a panelist to say something critical about the work. Um, no work is perfect, uh, whether it's a source question, whether it's a prose question, whether it's the role of biography versus scholarship, whether it's a trade press versus uh, an academic press. And I think different audiences respond differently to the kinds of books, and maybe, maybe that matters to how it's been received. Um, and then I think that uh, captures most of what I heard. So maybe one response from each of you in a free-willing manner to, to engage some of those questions, and we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm just going to refer to two. One, um, I didn't put the panel together. You have to ask the organizers. Um, and uh, you're not going to hear criticism from me about this book. Um, I think that this book was fabulous. And any things that I think, you know, differences I'd have would be fairly minor. But part of the why I'm saying this is that from the moment that Manning died, he has been trashed systematically by people around the country, some people who claim to be friends of his. Yeah. And it has been absolutely despicable to watch this. I don't want to hear anyone tell me that we're trying to turn Marable into an icon when the day, literally the day that Marable died, there were people that were trashing him and jumping on his grave. Yeah. So I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested in that discussion. This was... <laughs> on this question about the state, um, I think that there's many things that we can learn, uh, and this may not directly answer the questioner's question, but what I gathered from this, all the conclusions is, one, how to build an organization. Um, that that you're, we're building an organization in the context of a state that is viciously repressive, but flags the flag, uh, flags the, uh, flies the flag of democracy. And, and in that, the question of how do you build security? Real, I don't mean just simply patting people down, but how do you actually build security? A second thing is the question of successors. Uh, any organization, when you're going up against a ruling class as vicious as ours, has to be thinking about successors. And one of the things that Malcolm did not have time to do, the question in my mind was whether he was thinking about it, was actually putting into place successors. One of the things that I was always struck by when I looked at the Vietnamese Communist Party is that even though Ho Chi Minh was held up as a great leader, they had a very collective leadership, and they, and they were always prepared in case someone got taken out. And this is one of the things here in the United States that we, we have real problems with. Another is the, the issue of massive infiltration. Um, and, and this is something that in this age of Facebook and the internet, when many people seem to think that that's private conversation, uh, and I mean that seriously, you've got to be thinking about that all of this stuff ends up being out there somewhere. And we have to be very careful in terms of the way that we communicate, because the other part of this is that the state is incredibly good about promoting rumors. And this is one of the things that those of us that were either in or around the Black Panther Party, the Republican of Africa, and other groups, were very, very familiar with the way that rumors were used to disrupt organizations and to turn people against one another. Um, and, and I guess the final thing is that we don't, we have to be careful about martyrdom. Because one of the questions that Marable, uh, grapples with implicitly in that book is whether or not Malcolm should have left the country for a number of years until things cooled down with the Nation of Islam and other uh, organizations. And that notion of leaving 
is not cowardice. Lenin, lost, less, uh, Lenin left Russia right, for a certain period of time. People leave countries, go into temporary exile for any number of reasons, and was it a value that we preserved his life? And I think these are a number of things that are related to the question of the state and repression that came at me from the book. Thank you. On a seat. Well, I, uh, I thought that I was, in my presentation, arguing that we had to go beyond the terms of discussion of the book, that we either uh, defend it or dismiss it. So the, the recognition of the value of the book does not mean that we should not engage in critical reading of the, what the book is and what it means. There are numbers of things that, that we can uh, question about it, but given that the, I mean, including what you were saying about the biography vis-a-vis -vis, uh, historical scholarship, I mean, how, what, is, what is the relation, the balance between historical scholarship and biography, the way that it's written, uh, questions of sources that were uh, mentioned, uh, but the problem is that the atmosphere is so loaded that I understand Bill's reaction. I, I was also a, a student of, of Manning in directly and indirectly, and the trashing of his work out of a critique of this book, it's something that we have to publicly condemn. And I think that we, we, it's important to do that. Uh, which does not mean that, that we should not also engage into a critical re reading of, of the book as Manning did, a critical engagement with the figure of Malcolm, which is what I was trying to say also. So I mean, to do that is, is a very difficult task, given the stakes, emotional and political stakes of, on, on, on Malcolm, on the figure of Malcolm and, and, and putting under uh, scrutiny. The, the question of the state, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that, that it's clear when you do a, and, and what you were saying, that one of the things that is not really discussed enough in the public debate is the account that there is that of the assassination of Malcolm and, and the role of the state in that, and the role of repression and state violence, and the, the Im implications that exist in terms of that, and the implications in, in terms of the question of my friend William Fred uh, Santiago of the way that we read the role of the state today. Because there, there are, the, the sister who was asking about the iconic figure of Barack Obama, I think that this is a very much welcome kind of question. I used to ask when Obama was uh, elected, what it means to have a black emperor. <laughs> and one of the, one of the, uh, Thing that I think is being demonstrated by the presidency of Obama is the limit of the presidency as an office. I mean, the, 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 the structural constraints of anybody to be able to exercise any change, anybody who is in that, in that, in that position, uh, in spite of whatever kind of good intentions, and I don't think that the intentions of Obama had ever been the best, because we have to, to characterize what kind of politician is always being, but beyond that, to recognize the class, gender, and racial character of the state. I mean, this is an imperial capitalist patriarchal state. And that is going to have its effect in the way that we frame our politics vis-a-vis -vis the state and the, the recognition that we have of the limits and possibilities of doing politics of transformation in relationship to the state. So I mean, the, the, this is, this is a, a question that I think that is not addressed enough, and, and I, I welcome the, the kind of question that he's asking. The third thing that I want to say is about spirituality. And what is this book uh, means for a new generation? I, I think that the the question of redemption, I mean, not only reinvention, but redemption. The, the role of spirituality in building political community, in transforming the, the individual and being a transformative force in the world. The, the complex reading of Islam 
in, in, in the book and of the transformative power of Islam, I think that is something that we have to vindicate. And it's part of, of the things that we have not really uh, discussed enough, we haven't debated enough what is the way in which the role of spiritual, spirituality in the life of Malcolm and, and in the historical and political scenario is, is represented in, in, in the book. Uh, but it's one of the definite forces that is presented there as, as a resource of hope, as a way of, of a building change under the most difficult situations. And I think that the sister who was, who was talking about her own situation, uh, you can see yourself in the mirror of Malcolm, who was somebody who from the most difficult situation emerged to be one of the most important leaders that we had in the past and that we still vindicate in the present. Thank you. Very quickly, in terms of um, the book, in terms of criticism uh, on the panel, I, I wrote a review essay um, for the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, as a scholar, you've got to be critical of, of, of anything. Um, so even a Pulitzer Prize winning book, even a magnum opus like this book is, you've got to constructively criticize and engage. Criticism and constructive criticism and engagement is not demonization. And that's so, so I certainly have critiqued the book. I've, I've written a long review essay where there is criticism of the book. But what we saw as soon as the book was published was demonization that was so quick. It was obvious that many people were writing uh, vicious polemics against the book without having read it. So in that context, as somebody who is not a baby boomer, who wasn't born in the 1960s, but who has dialogued with those folks, and they've talked to me about the sectarianism of the 60s and 70s, and vicious attacks and assaults, you really saw it in the aftermath of the publication of this book, where there were whole sheaths of paper just written about this book uh, that were very, and really uh, attacking the character of Professor Marable. And everybody knows the one word that you could describe Manning Marable as is integrity. Every, everybody knows that. The, the integrity of his scholarship, the integrity of who he was as a human being. So you saw this was, this was like um, when we talk about uh, Stalinist Russia and we talk about what happened to uh, 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 not, not Lenin but Trotsky, where they're sending uh, their running dogs after people who are not believing in their, sectarian in their sectarian line. And these are the people who are saying they're revolutionaries. They're saying they want to replace this existing order and they're going to be the head of the new order. And these people have no compassion, no integrity, and they're saying they want to transform the world. You can't transform the world without love and compassion. So in, the, in that sense, I, I completely agree. In terms of um, the young woman who was talking about uh, uh, three, three children and, and prison, um, Malcolm and, and this biography, what you can get out of this is that Malcolm is coming out of the working class. Malcolm is intimately connected to poverty. Malcolm is intimately connected to what people call the underclass. Michelle Alexander is calling the undercast right now. Uh, when we think about Malcolm X's life, what, what, what you can learn from reading the biography is how somebody could actually speak truth to power and struggle out of this caste system, struggle out of a system of racial oppression, and really struggle out of a system that is trying to contain and constrain and demonize black bodies, whether they're women, children, infants, or the elderly. So the book has a huge lesson for the contemporary situation that we find ourselves in. And finally, this idea of, of, of Malcolm as a prison intellectual is very, very important. We have um, 2 million people in prison, um, 7.3 million people who are in prison, parole, probation. We have more people in prison now than when Brown was passed, May 17, 1954. We have more people in prison now um, um, than were incarcerated. Uh, uh, the, the, the previous um, um, history of the Republic before 1980, we've seen a huge rise of nonviolent drug offenders, pre predominantly black males. And the reverberating effect is that not only do you go to prison, but once you're a convicted felon, you have to check that box on, on employment applications for the rest of your life. Once you're a convicted felon, thanks to Bill Clinton, who's 
a black America's hero, apparently, if you watch CNN. Bill Clinton and the Welfare Reform Act, 1996, people that the civil rights community, Mary Wright Edelman said was gonna put two million more children under poverty, including a bunch of black children. That Welfare Reform Act says that if you are a convicted felon, you risk having your, 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 the mother of your baby being thrown out of public housing if you spend one night over there. The recidivism rate for black men who've been spending time in prison is 70% because there is no opportunity once they leave prison, right? And that's the new world order. And when we talk about Obama's iconography, the only thing about Obama's iconography is this. Black people got confused once he was elected in 2008. When you look at a picture of Barack Obama, and when you look at a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. and Lyndon Johnson, and a picture of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, Obama is Lincoln and Lyndon Johnson. He is not Frederick Douglass, and he is not Martin Luther King Jr. They were not presidents. They were activists. They were social movement leaders. You can't have a president of the United States be some kind of radical or revolution, revolutionary. It won't work, ever. Ever, right? So the only problem with his iconography is that some people got it twisted. He's the president, he's not Dr. King. You all right? So, um, <laughs> our work is almost done here. I wanted to encourage you all um, with this parting thought to visit the Barack Obama exhibition. <laughs> A look behind the presidency, which is here at the Schomburg Center. <laughs> well, it's ironic and iconic, but it gives, it gives me a great opportunity to, to, to have one final word on this. Um, I think that in response to Johanna's point about the presupposition, I want to say that Peniel posed Maribel's work in a tradition of recovering the black radical tradition. And I think I was trying to suggest that that's not all of black America, either working class, middle class, et cetera, that it represents one strain of the black experience. And so if we're going to end with a a kind of attempt to appreciate or reconcile Barack Obama with both the legacy of Malcolm X and the work of Manning Maribel, it seems to me that what we're seeing in the critique that you just made is not the evolution of a black radical tradition in light of this nation's first black presidency, but in fact something akin to what has always been a bulwark against radical traditions in America, which is black people's own acceptance of the terms of capitalism in this country. So, not a happy place to end, I'm not sure, but there's a beautiful exhibition in the front gallery. Please join me all uh, in thanking our panel. It's been a wonderful conversation.